What's up guys, Steelfredo here. We're back with another tech review for Thursday and this is actually gonna be my first tech review in full 4K. We're back on cameras and the camera that I'm filming with will be the first camera that I've shot in 4K with for a tech review, which is ironic because the camera we're talking about is one of the lowest quality cameras you can buy. This is the Holga 120N, so we're gonna talk about it today. Now when I first got my hands on this camera, I would have pretty much automatically assumed that this was something straight out of like the 70s or 80s. This is such a plasticky camera, like literally the entire body of this camera, you can hear it shaking around. I'm gonna put it down so it's not shaking while I record. That whole camera is plastic. The lens is plastic, the body's plastic, the rollers, the mechanisms, everything except for a couple of springs and a tripod mount are all plastic. But with all that being said, and me thinking this was straight out of the 80s with the plastic build, this was actually introduced in 2003 as a replacement for another Holga camera. Now this is an interchangeable film camera, similar to some of the SLR cameras of its time, and even earlier than that, but at the time, this camera was introduced when 120 film was sort of phasing out. And we're going to go over some technical terms so you guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about 120 film and 35mm film. So traditionally, when you think of changeable film cameras, you would probably think of something like this, a 35 millimeter film canister. It's kind of small, it's got, as the name implies, a 35 millimeter film strip in it. So 35 millimeters is the size of the slide of film that you'd be shooting. And in a regular camera nowadays, a DSLR camera, this would be considered full frame because a full frame camera digitally is trying to simulate the 35 millimeter film that we were shooting on back in the early 2000s and earlier than that as well. Now when I talk about 120 film, this is what I'm talking about. This is it compared to a 35 millimeter. Now this is significantly bigger than a 35 millimeter roll of film. Now 35 millimeter rolls of film had a more rectangular shape to them, so you get this sort of not quite 16 by 9 aspect ratio, it's like a 3 by 2. This is 6 by 6. This is a square format of film. And this was what the Holga took. This was actually one of the cheapest 120 film cameras you could buy. And 120 film was actually more traditionally used in what would be considered nowadays a medium format camera. So if you want to look up medium format cameras, you're probably going to find things nowadays for digital like a Hasselblad. These are like eighty to a hundred thousand dollar cameras that shoot medium format digitally. Back in the day, that was still pretty much true. You got very expensive cameras that would shoot 120 except for this camera, which was about $35 when it was new. But then why would a camera that cheap shoot 120? And why did they make the camera that cheap to begin with if they were gonna put 120 film in it, which is more traditionally used for professional photography? Well, when Universal Electronics started making this camera way, way back, the early versions of the Holga before they made the 120N, it was a toy camera. Or for a lot of kids who grew up in the 90s like I did, you'll probably find it more akin to something like, say, one of these. So yeah, it was a toy camera that was not disposable because you could actually take a bunch of pictures with it and you could then go get them developed and continue shooting with the same camera. You weren't spending $10 or so on a pack of disposable cameras that you'd never get back because once the film was spent, it was spent. So they made it cheap, they made it easy to use, and they made it very cheap. I know I said that twice, but God, you have to feel one of these to understand how cheap it feels. So you have two options with the camera, and you can see on the back you've got a slider for 12 and 16. So this is going to be for shooting with either the 6x6 film or a 6x4.5, which is a little more of a square format like you would get with a 35mm camera. And you can change out a section, which I lost, that will let you change between those two formats of film. Once the film's loaded, there's a roller on the right side to advance the film, and as you advance it, you can see the numbers and different icons go past on the little red window on the back. Once you're out of film, of course, you can actually pop down two little metal tabs which sometimes pop down on their own even when you are still running a full roll of film through the camera and take the film out. Of course you have to make sure it's rolled all the way through so you're not exposing some film that you didn't mean to and ruining your photos. I know I keep bashing on how cheap this camera is but one of the features that was an upgrade for the 120N was putting foam inside of the body of the camera to increase film tension because this thing had no film tension or it would literally bow the film if you didn't roll it the whole way through and keep tension. Like manually keep tension. It was, it was stupid. As for control, there really isn't much. There's a couple options. You have a slider on the top, which on early models actually really didn't do anything that was supposed to adjust it for cloudy or bright sunlight. Um, later on, they actually made that adjust the aperture. All it did in this camera was sort of slow down the shutter speed or speed up the shutter speed. 
Outside of that, you have a shutter speed control on the bottom that goes with N or bulb. And N is about 1 100th of a second, and bulb is essentially just gonna leave it open until you let go of the shutter. Now, this would normally be a cool idea if you're gonna be doing long exposures, but considering there's no way to remotely set it off, every long exposure you're gonna take is gonna be just stupid shaky. It's, it, I don't know why they put it on there. You have a tripod mount on the bottom, so you can hook it up to, well, a tripod, and it's one of the few metal components on the entire camera, as well as a flash on top. Like, there's a flash mount on top for some reason, and I've never really understood why, because you can't really sync a flash to it, and if you wanted to, I mean, you could have more power to you, I guess. Now, as I mentioned earlier, just like everything else on this camera, the lens is plastic. It's a 60 millimeter lens, and it's an F8 lens, and on the later models where you could actually adjust the aperture, you could change it from F8 to f11 stop it down a little bit and maybe help deal with some brighter sunlight conditions but it's still not that great <laughs> the reason why they put the aperture so small is because your focus options are basically one person three people seven people and the mountains that's literally the icons that they put on the focus roller and it's just guesstimating because the viewfinder is not actually looking directly through the lens you're looking off and up to the left so when you take pictures, of course, you have to compensate for where the lens is actually going to be looking because what you see is not exactly what the lens is seeing. So if everything about this camera that I'm saying seems to be a downside, why am I even talking about it? Well, everything I've said so far combines to make a rather interesting and very artistic outlet for photography. Some people call it lamography. I call it just photography because you're taking a photo, but we I'm not going to go into lamography versus photography. That's a video for a later date. But it makes you think a little differently about photography when you go to use this camera because you can't just pull the focus, check a light meter, change your ISO, and all that stuff. You literally have one film speed, one aperture, and your focus. So the only things that you can think about is, is the shot in focus? and is it composed well? And it is the quickest and easiest way. Well, here, look at these photos. This camera is the quickest and easiest way to force yourself to think about composition first and foremost. Like these shots here, I've shot exclusively in black and white just because I tend to like the look of black and white. It forces not only the composition to be on point, you have to get that composition right or it's just gonna look bad, but you also have to really make sure that the subject pops. And that's kind of why I like shooting in black and white on this camera exclusively. Even shots like this, where the lighting is not exactly the best, there's enough highlights in the background that even though these birds in the actual like museum were gold, they were very colorful, pulling all that color out really did make it pop more in my opinion. I don't know, maybe that's just me. You can also do things like accidentally double exposing the film where you forget to advance it and you set the shutter twice like this photo. And I actually really like the way this thing goes because it's, I don't know, it's so weird. It's, it's, it's a really interesting and artistic shot. And that's kind of the point of why I shoot with this camera is because everything cheap about it makes it more artistic and desirable for me at least. So if you ever wanna get into just focusing on the composition of photography, you want to narrow in and primarily practice composition and focus. This is the camera to do that with. It is the easiest way to get into the habit of thinking about how you're gonna compose your shot before taking it versus taking a bunch of shots and deleting the ones that don't work. The funny thing too is depending on the temperature, which I noticed this because I've shot now in the winter and getting into spring, the, the temperature of all things can actually affect the shutter. The mechanism is super simple on the shutter, so I'm not surprised it doesn't take much. Plastic will expand and contract in the cold, so does, uh, so does metal, which there's only a handful of metal things like this spring that's running the gearing for the, uh, for the shutter. But it's, it's funny, and the shutter sound is actually really nice. This is probably one of the coolest shutter sounds apart from like a fully clockwork mechanical SLR camera. Like, that's just cool. Listen. So overall, I could kind of ramble, but in general, this is a good camera to have on you if you're willing to spend the money on film, spend $25 now to get one of these cameras, and just have a film camera with you that is small enough that chances are you're going to get the shot when you want it. And that's what I love about it. It's small, it's light, it's portable, it's fairly durable, and there are certain things that it has about it that you wouldn't think would be good things, like the light bleed, for example. This picture has 
a perfect example of light bleed, where it got into an area that it shouldn't have, the light got into an area that it shouldn't have, and it still came out as a very interesting shot because it kind of framed the shot up. So in general, yeah, I would recommend this camera for people getting into photography who want to focus primarily on composition and focus. I know I recommended the uh, Pentex uh, K1000 before as the starting camera, which that is going to be a starting camera for people who are into full photography and they want to just have something that would be the equivalent of getting a DSLR but for film. But if you're kind of more into the artistic side of things, you want to be a little more creative, break some rules and learn some rules, go with the Hoga 120N. It's cheap, it's pretty nice, and I, no, that's a lie, it's not nice. <laughs> but it's cheap, and it shoots on a big format film that not a lot of people really think of shooting on anymore because of the types of cameras that they normally have to shoot them with. Buy $25 Holga cameras all day long and get 120 film and you're set. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this review. It's a bit of a ramble, but I need to stop myself because I'll fanboy about this camera all day long. But it's a great camera to shoot on. It's a very basic camera to shoot on. And if you want to be a little artistic with your photography and kind of break out and, you know, go outside your comfort zone, go with it. Because it's definitely a lot easier to be creative with this than it is to be creative with a disposable camera. <laughs> Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Leave a comment letting me know what you guys think. Uh, I will actually put a link to where you can buy one of these cameras on Amazon down in the description. I'm not sponsored or anything, but I figured if you're interested, you can go down and check it out. And I'll probably put a link to some 120 film so you can actually have the whole package. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Let me know what you think about the quality, too, because I'm really excited to actually be shooting on a reasonably well-designed uh, well camera. So anyway, guys, I'll see you in the next video. Make sure to be there and have a good one.